Isle Delfino is an ever-changing locale packed with conflict and resolution. The relationship between all life forms pushing and pulling for control and order while at the same time corrupting and changing what is already there. While a casual player may not stop to analyze the implications of certain species' presence in Isle Delfino, there are numerous complex interactions and histories that are constantly evolving even in the small snapshot of Mario's short-lived stay. In this video, I will be analyzing the local ecosystem of the different environments within Mario Sunshine, diving into each entity's relationships with its surroundings, its goals and effects, which animals are not as they seem, and which are entirely fabricated monsters made by Bowser Jr. Let's take a plunge into the broader ecosystem and attempt to analyze the meaning behind the character designs of Mario Sunshine's creatures. As soon as Mario and company arrive at the Delfino airstrip, they already encounter some of the most prevalent entities of Isle Delfino, discovering the first specimen of invasive animalia that we will encounter throughout the course of the game. The creatures born from group are destructive enemies that are spawned by Shadow Mario, a disguise for Bowser Jr., using his magic paintbrush. Luckily for us, these group monsters are particularly vulnerable to Flood, Mario's water-blasting robotic backpack bestie. This will be the first indicator of whether any animal Mario encounters is native to Delfino's ecosystem or not, as native life typically won't be so easily watered down. The protopiranhas, or guardians, are the most obvious example, appearing before Mario even steps off of the runway. Protopiranhas are slimy and non-solid, as well as weak to Flood's water. Not only this, but we see them forming directly from the magical goop that Bowser Jr. has left behind. Considering that these are the first creatures we see after Shadow Mario's rampage, it is reasonable to assume that they are some of Bowser Jr.'s earliest creations. As we will see later on, the goopy adversaries Mario faces become much more complex as the game continues and, therefore, are harder to differentiate from the local flora and fauna. But there are a number of ways to sniff them out as we'll be discussing. Following directly behind on the list of obviously invasive creatures are goobles, otherwise known as swoop and stews, slug-like balls of transparent ink that emerge from any puddle of goop bigger than Mario's head. While they're clearly animated ink, just like the Guardians, Goobles are slightly more developed than their protopiranha predecessors, sporting actual eyes and being of a slightly unique consistency, different to the magic ink they spawn from. The final nail in the coffin is that they are severely weak to water, landing them squarely in the category of obviously invasive adversary. Bianco Hills is the first course of the game and therefore is also our first look at the broader ecosystem of Isle Delfino, introducing much of the recurring wildlife and enemies created by Bowser Jr. with his magic paintbrush. With a lovely local village and farm animals, Bianco Hills showcases an idyllic symbiosis between the local Piantas and the native life. In the first episode, Mario is greeted by Piantas casually walking around the local village, speaking to him with little urgency. You see seagulls fly between the mossy stone walls above the path to the Pianta village and observe even the strolling stews happily walking in rows along the aqueducts. Bianca Hills is bright and beautiful, and then just as quickly as he arrives, Mario turns a corner and sees the nearby lakeside completely caked in goop, topped off with rolling boulders of the stuff drenching the remaining paths as slug-like creatures emerge from the pits. This is only compounded in later episodes as the village itself is submerged in even more ink, completely unraveling the perfect equilibrium that so apparently once stood in Bianco Hills. Let us then try to pick apart where it all went wrong by inspecting the situation one creature at a time. Stroll and Stews are local to Bianco Hills as well as Pinna Park, Serena Beach, Pianta Village, and the Delfino airstrip where you first arrive. While your first encounter with Stroll and Stews seems to imply that they are also goop creatures sporting the same ink that the first few enemies Mario encounters had and spreading it along the ground, it is soon revealed that these first Strolling Stews were victim to the same pollutants that the rest of the local wildlife had been impacted by. Once you encounter a clean Stroll and Stew, it becomes apparent that they no longer spread Bowser Jr.'s ink, nor can they produce it themselves. Once more, they are far more resilient to flood and must first be knocked over or crushed to be defeated. 
While still hostile to Mario, Shrill and Suze really are just local victims to Shadow Mario's machinations, and considering their passive nature among the local Piantas, it is possible they're even attempting to defend their local environment, mistaking Mario for his shadowy doppelganger. Later on, Pinna Park also has strolling stews and two flying variants, as well as dangos, which are much larger stews that transport towers of strolling stews on their backs. And I just think it's really cute that dangos are named after the Japanese dessert dangos, which unsurprisingly look very similar being stacked balls of mochi rather than stews. Anyway, Poinks are spherical, pig-like creatures that can be found inside the Pianta village of Bianco Hills, excitedly following Mario around if he draws too close. Poinks move in herds and are only found within this one village, apart from there being a small chance that King Boo can summon them during his boss fight. Friendly and juvenile, they suckle onto Flood's nozzle and perhaps confuse it for a source of food. And if Flood is activated while a Poink is attached, the Poink will fill up and shoot out like a water balloon. The locals have a good amount of knowledge regarding these creatures, teaching Mario about them when asked, and they are most likely a sort of livestock, even being based off of pigs in both name and design. As such, Poinks are likely not native to Isle Delfino, and if they are, they are probably the consequence of selective breeding. Luckily, Poinks are one of the most well-contained animals on the island, so they are still most likely not responsible for any negative impacts on their environment. In fact, when being shot from Flood's nozzle, they can even help clean off goop from other surfaces. On the other hand, the same cannot be said about cuckoos, which are another animal based on livestock. These chicken-like enemies fly in short circles, intermittently dropping goop along their path in Bianco Hills and Pianta Village. Although it seems as though goop is just a general placeholder for various forms of waste and pollution in Isle Delfino, making it likely that it is not directly related to Bowser Jr.'s ink. And considering that cuckoos have a resistance to Flood's water, they are likely not created by Bowser Jr. at all. Even still, this doesn't mean cuckoos are native to Isle Delfino, as they are only found in very close proximity to Pianta villages and are inspired by farm chickens. In the real world, domesticated livestock such as cows risk overgrazing and harming their environment, and chickens are no exception to this. In tourist destinations like Key West Island, the prevalence of feral chickens is a major concern for local ecologists as they easily mow down local flora. The fact that the cuckoos spread goop around the map can thus be interpreted as a homage to the fact that vector-borne diseases, pollutants, and all-around habitat destruction can often be brought about by livestock. Since there are no apparent predators to the cuckoos, the only thing distinguishing them from a truly nasty invasive species is how well they are contained, assuming that they are domesticated at all. And since they are seen flying freely, it seems surprisingly likely that these cuckoos are an invasive species to Isle Delfino, or at the very least spread by non-natural means. Pond skaters are large water striding insects that are very similar to the skaters which first appeared in Mario 64. They're not harmed by Flood's water, just temporarily stopped in their tracks when sprayed, and they also live on the surface of the pond, so they're clearly not born from group as they would otherwise be washed away. Coupled with the fact that they're not harmful to any local flora or fauna inside or out of the lake, they are clearly endemic to Bianco Hills. Pokies are large cactus-like creatures that mimic local flowers, suggesting that they may have evolved alongside them and developed a specific camouflage tuned to their environment. When hiding, pokies bury themselves underground, leaving only the flower atop their heads. They can be differentiated from a normal flower as they react differently when sprayed with flood, though they still remain underground. Seeing as they primarily keep to themselves, are not born from goop, and blend in seamlessly with their environment, I will hesitantly agree that they are also native to Bianco Hills, despite their hostile nature. This finally brings us to the various piranha plants we see in Bianco Hills. Just by analyzing their design, it's already clear that these specimens are all invasive. Familiar creatures from the Mushroom Kingdom that make an appearance in Al Delfino are usually drawn by Bowser Jr., pulling inspiration from the animals and plants alongside which he was used to growing up. Piranha plants are classic examples of such returning creatures. Additionally, piranha plants are based off of the Venus flytrap, which, fun fact, are not native to almost any place you could ever find them, only being native to a very small region between North and South Carolina. That means that if you've ever seen a Venus flytrap outside of that area, they've been artificially introduced by people. Lastly, you always see the piranha plant enemies drenched in or lying in ink, spreading it wherever they go. Piranha bonds rolling down paths to hinder Mario, piranha plants emerging from group and attacking him, and PD piranha growing brambles over already existing structures, which means that they've only recently started to grow in the region, coming well after even the buildings had been constructed. The locals have no idea what PD piranha is or where he came from. This sort of reaction will be reoccurring throughout Super Mario Sunshine, Pianta is being awestruck when they see their landscape transformed by unfamiliar invaders. Rico Harbor has some of the most interesting world building when it comes to the ways the locals interact with the native and invasive animals. Clambers, which are also referred to as yellow spiders and scuttlebugs in the Mario Sunshine Guides, are seen scaling the metal fences of the construction site off the shore of Rico Harbor. 
While we never see them attack local Piantas, it is possible they would if a Pianta ever tried to climb on their fenced territory. Since we don't know, we can't say with 100% certainty how they interact with other creatures living in their environment, but nothing is there to suggest that they cause any harm to their ecosystem. They are also resistant to water, so they are likely not created by Bowser Jr. All of this points to the fact that scuttlebugs are endemic to Rico Harbor. Tobyfish, or cheap cheeps, are also present in Rico Harbor, as well as Delfino Airstrip, Gelato Beach, Noki Bay, and Serena Beach in various colors. They typically reside in deep water, and some will attempt to drag Mario down into it. They otherwise don't pose any direct threat, and a special lava variant can be found in Corona Mountain. There are warning signs in Gelato Beach as to the Tobyfish, which can drag you down, which seems to imply that they are commonly found in the region. They can even be found swimming within a very healthy coral beach, so I can only conclude that they pose absolutely no threat to their local ecosystem. Hooray! The most ubiquitous animal in Rico Harbor, however, are the bloopers, which are numerous not just in their sheer numbers, but also in their variety, taking a handful of forms. Some are very destructive, while others are docile. Because of this wide diversity, it isn't immediately clear what, exactly, the bloopers' role is in Rico Harbor. When you first arrive, for instance, you are greeted with small rows of boats full of dead bloopers and blue pads, otherwise known as jumping bloopers. It is only revealed in later episodes that these boats are typically full of various local fish. While there has clearly been a massive influx of bloopers in Rico Harbor, shown by these boats brimming with their bodies, it could also indicate a degree of local knowledge, since the peon does know how to fish for them. We also know that bloopers have existed in Rico Harbor for some time, because there are domesticated varieties of them known as blooper racers, unique to Isle Delfino, and owned by a pianta named Big Daddy, used for the local blooper surfing competitions. Blooper racers have differing abilities depending on the racer blooper's coat, green bloopers being slow and quick turning, purple bloopers being very fast but slow to turn, and yellow bloopers having a balance in between. Hey. Do see Phoenix here, and I just have to cut in for a moment. Over on my channel, I specialize in noticing all those little details most players won't look twice at, and I've got something to add. While looking at Rico Harbor's in-game brochure page, I noticed this little blooper displayed in the corner. It's tough to read, but this blurb says, We are delicious! And I couldn't help but find that odd. As you pointed out, once you've cleared away the blooper infestation brought on by Gooper Blooper's presence, the fishing boats are full of tropical fish, as is the newly reopened market on the upper road. Despite some bloopers still being present in the level, they don't seem to be much of a priority for the local fishermen. I wonder then if the bloopers really are that delicious, or if this blurb is just a marketing tactic to sell them to tourists as a delicacy or acquired taste. The piantas bringing in the catch of the day more than likely stake their livelihood on it after all. I'm reminded of the African practice of snare art, where locals will disarm snare traps set for the purposes of poaching and bushmeat hunting, and turn the wire into intricate sculptures to sell to locals and tourists alike. People invested in the conservation of their native wildlife can do amazing things to find the silver lining in an otherwise difficult situation. Regardless of the blooper's natural relationship with Rigo Harbor, the port is absolutely overrun with them when Mario first arrives. None of the piantas you speak to, however, seem to have anything to say about the infestation of smaller bloopers, rather focusing on the sudden appearance of the massive gooper blooper. And though squids are heavily associated with ink, the smaller bloopers don't seem to leave any trail of the substance on their own, indicating that the pollution has derived from an alternate source. The first time anyone even mentions ink is when this dock worker in the first episode, Gooper Blooper Breaks Out, complains about the blooper ink around the loading dock. Just what in the blazes is this stuff? I can't even get my work done! This indicates that the boss variety might not be native to the area as opposed to the smaller ones that have nevertheless taken over the harbor. While these bloopers do disappear when knocked into the ocean, there's no indication that they dissolve, nor do they drop any coins, unlike when they're stomped on land. They're also resistant to flood spray, making it very unlikely that they are goop constructs at all. You even encounter blue pads swimming in the ocean, so it wouldn't be much of a stretch to assume that land-dwelling bloopers might just despawn when coming into contact with water for mechanical reasons, to avoid having to program multiple behaviors for the same enemy. So, the smaller bloopers and blue pads are clearly not what is causing a problem in Rico Harbor. The increase in blooper activity, then, is likely due to the sudden arrival of the Gooper Blooper, which is clearly much more destructive to the environment, causing the others to congregate in the area. It's important to note that the Gooper Blooper was, in the most literal sense, shipped to Rico Harbor, unlike its smaller counterparts. When we first encounter it, it is attempting to break out of a pile of shipping containers. In fact, the fact that it was stuck inside a shipping crate may explain why the ink seems to follow the very shipping crate strewn about Rico Harbor. We even see the ink leaking from the pile of crates into the jet black ocean, cementing the Gooper Blooper as the sole cause of all the recent pollution in Rico Harbor. The saddest part is that all of the resulting hostility may just be an awful miscommunication on the Gooper Blooper's part, an animal forcibly shipped out of its natural territory and then harassed by a tourist first meeting Mario as he rips off one of its tentacles. 
The gooper blooper is not to blame for the recent interruption in the equilibrium of Rico Harbor's ecosystem, but is rather its first victim. The blooper deserves our special attention because the squid, as an animal, is used to symbolize environmental destruction in sunshine. This is an apt choice. Culturally, squids, despite being animals, have always been used to represent sea monsters and the idea of invasiveness due to their ever-imposing tentacles, especially since the late 19th century. It's clear that the goober blooper's arrival was completely unnatural, and this is reinforced by its relationship with space. It is first crammed into a shipping crate and then extends its massive tentacles in all directions. As such, it's hard not to associate it with Bowser Jr.'s recent meddlings, which in some sense also represents a dark, contaminating force propagating outwards in Al Delfino. A force that can only be combated with the assistance of the Shines, which also happen to be eight-pronged entities that also radiate their power, that is, light, outwards. With this in mind, the entire game is presented from the beginning as a battle between good and evil, by getting as close as it can to the light versus darkness trope while still maintaining some sense of subtlety. It's literally everywhere, like how Bowser Jr.'s persona is just Shadow Mario, a dark Mario. The intro movie on the plane has him running around in contrast with the light atmosphere of the resort. The courthouse where Mario is put on trial is in complete darkness except for the characters themselves, and the player uses a sort of inverted ink, water, as the light to the ink's dark. Squids, then, are an obvious choice for a boss because they shoot ink. They already naturally contaminate, perfectly paralleling the ink that Bowser Jr. uses with his brush. There is this three-in-one symbolism of squids being monstrous, invasive, and polluting at the same time. And while the Goober Blooper and other mollusks fit this prototypical image perfectly, they're not the only creatures in Mario Sunshine to do so. The protopiranhas that we saw earlier have tentacles too. What makes the idea of the tentacles symbolic isn't just the fact that they're grabby, but rather they feel alien. They're slimy. And they're scary. In a sense, it's poetic that there's a struggle between that and a place called Isle Delfino, given that dolphins and octopi are thought of as two of the smartest sea creatures, painting a picture of a macro-scale battle between equally intelligent forces of good and evil. The fauna of Gelato Beach pose great significance to the local Pianta culture, and there's quite a lot to discuss regarding it as well. The Great Sandbird is, for instance, the shining gem of Gelato Beach being incubated for a century within a man-made structure before hatched and soaring around. It's a prideful and exciting event for the residents of Gelato Beach, and is clearly, at least to a degree, separated from the generally touristy spin that most locations have. The Sandbird isn't the only creature exclusive to Gelato Beach, as they share that honor with the intriguing Dune Buds. As their name suggests, these large flowery plants bury themselves in the sand and are found nowhere on the planet apart from Gelato Beach. The locals teach Mario about them, saying, Dune Buds are odd plants that appear only on this beach. When watered, they expand and shoot out dragging the sand nearby, temporarily creating pits and sometimes even giant mountains of sand. They can even create structures like stairways and a giant sand castle. Since the structures they create vary so much, I think it's possible the locals prune these dune buds to create very specific shapes when watered to encourage tourist travel, but that's just a theory. Cataquacks roam around the beach as well and attack Mario when he gets too close to them and come in two different colors, red and blue. They're short-sighted and likely have trouble seeing with their glazed-over eyes, and since their namesake takes after inocular disease. Cataquacks are friendly with local Pianta and visiting Nokis, and primarily keep to themselves, making them most likely endemic to Dalvik beaches. The same can certainly not be said for their cousins, the Plungelos. Although they look similar, Plungelos are much larger than Cataquacks, with smaller, sharper beaks and a cute little plant growing on top of their head. Plungelos are very interesting creatures, mimicking not one but two completely different species, both of which can be found outside of Mario Sunshine, Cataquacks, and Wigglers. They are only seen in one episode of Mario Sunshine, attacking the Sandbird's incubation tower, climbing onto the reflectors and turning them away. The locals are shocked and have no idea where these Plungelos have come from, nor what they are. This immediate danger that they pose to the ecosystem, as well as their sudden appearance, makes Plungelos an easy addition to the list of invasive species in Mario Sunshine. Even their name is unpleasant, which not only references the plungers of restroom fame that resemble their legs, but also highlight the fact that they literally have suction cups built into them, just like the goober blooper we saw earlier. In other words, they're stuck somewhere that the Piantas really don't want them to be, like many of the other invasive critters at Dot Isle Delfino. There's also something quite dark, no pun intended, about the resemblance to cataquacks in that cataracts, as a disease, fog up the eyes, lens, and prevent light from being focused, which is exactly what these pesky creatures have been doing to the sandbird. 
But there's still one more question. Why are the Plungelos protecting this Wiggler that has climbed onto the Sandbird's incubation tower? What's utterly horrifying is that when Mario successfully knocks the Plungelos off of these reflectors, allowing them to point at the Sandbird egg and cook the sleeping Wiggler, is that the now superheated Wiggler they were guarding completely falls apart. This scene made my jaw drop when I first saw it. There was something so grotesque about the way the Wiggler dies, let alone the fact that you aren't even spending this level trying to stop the Wiggler. You're trying to stop the Plungelos from tampering with the Incubator, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, this Wiggler breaks into pieces. Well, I'm here to save your childhood, because if you were paying attention to the Plungelos introduction, I did say that they also mimicked Wigglers. The biggest difference between a Plungelo and a Cataquack is their larger body and the sprouts on their head. These things make it much easier for a line of Plungelos to team together to mimic one large Wiggler. The lead Plungelos plant blooms while the following Plungelos hide their stems, creating a very convincing Wiggler. This is why the Plungelos are defending the Wiggler, and more so, this is how the Wiggler returns in the next episode of Gelato Beach after seemingly falling apart in the previous one. The first Wiggler was never a Wiggler. The Wiggler is by far the strangest entry on this list, and not just because of its haunting introduction with the Plungelos. Just like the Plungelos, the people of Gelato Beach have no idea what it is, saying, There's luck at the top of the tower! Some weird thing has curled up on the tower to take a nap! Now, I would like to propose a small conspiracy theory to settle exactly why its portrayal of Mario Sunshine is so strange. When the Wiggler angrily storms Gelato Beach, Mario is tasked with protecting the locals by watering the native dune buds, which knocks the Wiggler on its back, allowing Mario to ground pound on its exposed underbelly. At no point is the Wiggler defeated by or even slowed by Flood's water, although it does blow steam from its nose when sprayed. This makes it extremely unlikely that the Wiggler was created using Shadow Mario's magic paintbrush. And why does this matter? We've already seen cases of invasive species arriving in Isle Delfina without originating from Bowser Jr., so this Wiggler is clearly just a similar case. Except it definitely isn't, because when you finally defeat the Wiggler, it doesn't explode into ink, it doesn't fall apart, but it turns into a pile of sand. We never actually see a single real Wiggler during the entirety of Mario Sunshine. Some of the returning enemies look different in Mario Sunshine, most likely because Bowser Jr. drew them poorly, trying to remember what they originally looked like. And the Wigglers of Mario Sunshine don't just look different, they act different. They don't change color when enraged like other Wigglers do. They're much larger and they're completely isolated from the rest of the ecosystem. But this doesn't make any sense. How can it be fake and yet at the same time not made from Bowser Jr.'s magic paintbrush? Not even made from goop at all? Well, dear viewer, the answer can be found in two of the most unique factors of Gelato Beach's ecosystem, the Sandbird and the Dune Bud. We've already seen that sand can be animated in Gelato Beach, making up the very much living and flying sandbird, as well as being present in the sculpting abilities of the dune buds. Clearly, the sand of Gelato Beach is somehow capable of being brought to life, and I think it all lies in the ability of the dune bud. There's no way we can know for sure, hence my speculations, but I believe that Bowser Jr. used his magic paintbrush alongside the dune buds to temporarily animate a large mass of sand into a wiggler, or at least a shadow of one, pun intended. He wanted Plungelos to migrate to Gelato Beach so that they would easily go unnoticed, at first being mistaken for cataplaxes before ultimately beating out the local ecosystem. Peanut Park highlights humanity's capacity for environmental destruction in center stage to such an extent that it almost becomes parody. The place is littered with explosives. Your introduction to the course is a dizzying roller coaster ride that has you dodging bullet bills while launching rockets at a mechanical fire breathing Bowser. And in commemoration of that fateful encounter, in a later episode, the locals hastily equip Mario with the same rockets on the same ride just to pop some inflatable Bowser balloons. Talk about an overkill. Not to mention, who knows where the rockets that fail to hit their targets even go. Most of them, I imagine, would hit an unsuspecting school of cheap cheeps, assuming that there are any still around in the vicinity. And I wouldn't even be surprised if all of these explosives were just a bunch of repurposed leftovers of the ones they used to clear out the area to build the park. Electro Koopas are strange Koopa variations that appear in packs dotted around Peanut Park and tampering with the machinery. It's no coincidence that these Koopas all arrive together, likely following their Electro Koopa King, who we later find in Episode 5, the runaway Ferris Wheel, only ever being seen invading Peanut Park after their Electro Koopa King settled down within Peanut Park's Ferris Wheel attraction. Although they are defeated using Flood's nozzle, they're immune to direct water attacks and are only affected because catching their shells creates sparks of electricity that hurt them when they are drenched. So, they're probably not born from goop and rather evolved to live in a more landlocked environment. In a similar case to both the Plungelos and Bloopers, it seems as though Bowser Jr. has attracted the Electro Koopas using a large version of the invading creatures. Sunflowers are very interesting, existing in both sentient and inanimate forms. Flowers local to the beach of Peanut Park. 
They're friendly and rooted to the ground, basking in the beach's sunlight under the wash of the larger great sunflower. They can even hold conversations with Mario and have lived on this beach for quite some time and thus are clearly endemic. Snoozakupas, or tamanokos, also feature solely in Peanut Park, mimicking the Yoshi eggs and feeding on the local sunflower's roots with its head buried under the soil, exposing its spotted shell back. The great sunflower, which protects the other smaller flowers, does not realize that these sea turtles are not truly Yoshi eggs until Mario services them and drives them off, saving the sunflowers. When defeated, sunflower patches bloom, showing an immediate relief on the ecosystem. Strangely, although they mimic Yoshi eggs, Yoshis are not seen anywhere at all in Isle Delfino up until this point in the game. When speaking with a toad, it's revealed that the Yoshis once lived in Isle Delfino, but fled once the Snoozakupas invaded and now competed them. These scaly turtles are responsible for the complete eradication of Yoshis as a native animal, and also would have quickly caused the local sunflowers to go extinct, making them a very dangerous invasive species to Pena Park's local wildlife. After defeating the Snoozakupas, a toad tells Mario that Yoshis may soon return to Isle Delfino since their predators had now been fended off, although later on in the sixth episode of Pena Park, a visiting Noki affirms that the Yoshis have not returned. Despite this, Mario encounters a handful of Yoshi eggs after this, and once hatched, can even feed and ride them just like any normal Yoshi. The strange thing is, at first this Yoshi egg is being defended by Shadow Mario, who appears to have some devious plot intended for the small endangered egg. Though, once saved, Mario soon learns that this Yoshi egg was in fact created by Bowser Jr. using his magic paintbrush. This is sadly backed up by the fact that these new Yoshis dissolve when coming into contact with water, so unfortunately, there may never be any real Yoshis again in Isle Delfino. Earlier, I mentioned that the parodic nature of Pina Park lies in the poor imitations that the park's designers have made of the nature that they have displaced, and this is visible all over the map. The Yoshi Carousel is perhaps the most egregious offender. Now that the actual species is gone, visitors have the opportunity to travel in a rigid circle and pretend to ride what was once a graceful occupant of the area. The clam cups have a coin in place of a pearl, their natural beauty has literally been replaced with just money. Even the secret episodes play with this idea, as the backgrounds present in both are completely different from the ones found in most of the other secret levels, which feature either a set of train tracks in a starry background or a pixelated NES-style Mario image. Here though, the roles are reversed, the canopy features nature, while the rest of Pena Park is teeming with man-made features. What's significant though, is the fact that the appearance of nature in those secret levels is just that, an appearance. The personified aspects of the natural world that these levels are trying to emulate, however, is completely absent. The Yoshi Island style background of the beach canon secret is devoid of its characteristic creature, and the sunflowers in the Yoshi Go Round secret are missing the faces that we see on those that we rescue outside of the park. The Yoshi Egg-esque moving blocks are all but a satire of what Yoshi is. Though they move Mario around just like his beloved companion, they have the potential to throw him into the void in what is arguably one of the hardest secret episodes of the game. They also have a rigid, blocky shape that betrays the roundness of an actual Yoshi egg. And once again, they don't sport any sort of facial features that we're accustomed to seeing on Mario's dinosaur friend. It reminds me of having a leopard skin hung up on your wall or something. Peanut Park takes beautiful elements of nature and distorts them into an artificial nightmare. And I think the saddest part about this can actually be found in the dialogue that the sunflowers give off when you're being blown to bits by Monty Mole. They ask if the bombs that he's shooting at you are fireworks. This is somewhat humorous in English, but it's far darker in the original Japanese version of the game, given that the Japanese word for firework, hanabi, literally means flower fire. In other words, this sunflower is so innocent and finds the idea of its habitat being blown up to be so alien that the only thing that it can compare a nefarious explosion to is one that looks like a flower. It can't even comprehend that its home is being destroyed, even though it's a victim of that destruction. By the time Mario arrives at Serena Beach in Noki Bay, there aren't many new animals to be introduced, so we'll be condensing their analysis into one segment for the purposes of this video. The manta in Serena Beach is the very first thing Mario has to deal with in the course, being tasked with resurfacing the Hotel Delfino, which has sunken into Bowser Jr.'s goop, much like the first few buildings in Delfino Plaza. The manta is a strange shadow that casts itself over Serena Beach, spreading ink as it traverses the ground, being an interesting return to the recognizable, shadowy, and inky design of the introductory enemies Mario first encounters upon landing on the airstrip. But this enemy cranks up everything to 11. It's massive, imposing, and completely overwhelming the first time you see it, although it's admittedly not the hardest fight once you're prepared. As someone who just so happened to play Splatoon 3 and Mario Sunshine at the same time, let me tell you, I was delighted to see that both games have the exact same boss fight. Shout out to Nintendo for efficiency because there's no other two games that would be more appropriate for this fight, and they are identical. I'm calling it now, Big Man from Splatoon 3 is in Mario Sunshine. 
none of that is entirely relevant to Mario Sunshine, especially since at the time of release there wouldn't be any connection to Splatoon until 20 years later, but it is wild. And considering that Super Mario 3D All-Stars also released the same year as Splatoon 3, I wouldn't be surprised if there was already buzz in the office about this boss fight alongside the development of Big Man, just saying. Almost in contrast, Noki Bay sports a more circumstantial type of ecological threat. In the first episode, Noki Bay's shore is toxic and bubbling purple. At first, the locals have no idea how to fix the problem and task Mario with unclogging the waterfall that Bowser Jr. blocked off with one of Bowser's Monty Moles. Surprisingly, though, this solution appears to have no effect whatsoever on the pollution of the ocean, and the Nokis continue their investigation. After finding that Ely Mouth, a supermassive undersea creature, has burrowed far down into the ocean, they conclude that it's the cause of the pollution and send Mario to investigate. As it turns out, its cavities have been emitting pollutants into the water. The cavities look very similar to the goop that Mario's encountered up until this point, possibly signifying that Bowser Jr. has directly caused this entire situation by harming Ely Mouth. Ely Mouth, unlike the Manta, is not actively deciding to pollute its waters, and when Mario successfully cleans its teeth and cures it of its oral disease, a heart ring of coins is left by the eel as it burrows away, leaving Noki Bay in peace. There is an interesting aspect of plants being invasive in Mario Sunshine. The Pianta settling on Delfino Island, the piranha plants terrorizing them, and the many, many hostile plants. And strangely, you defeat these plants by watering them. It feels as though someone not knowing how to care for their garden and harming their plants with their own good intentions, a poetic relationship between man and nature, not of malice but of mistake. Even as the protagonist defending Delfino Island, Mario is a foreigner and seems to be on the most artificial, as in man-made, side of the conflict. Arriving on a plane, and the tool that he uses, Flood, being a scientific gadget as opposed to Shadow Mario's paintbrush, Mario Sunshine shows us that humans can have this abusive relationship with nature, being powerful enough to both destroy and to undo that destruction. And yet, we don't simply have the knowledge to decide at all times how we impact the world, harming it by mistake. In the end, Mario Sunshine isn't a story of a thriving ecosystem, nor is it the story of man's single-handed destruction of nature. It's the story of the inevitable invasion of new species over time, aided by the settling of people bringing their domesticated pets, livestock, and killing off local life directly. It's very interesting to see that if Mario and Bowser had never arrived, Isle Delfino and its residents would still be facing large problems, with the Snoozakoopas finally killing off the last of the sunflowers, and the local livestock slowly killing off native species. And even when some of the enemies, such as the Stews and their bloopers, were posed as obstacles to Mario, they were in fact just defending their home from further invasion that all this tourism ultimately brought about. There's not just one person to point to and blame. Mario's sunshine highlights the complexity of life and those pushing to survive even when it's at the expense of others. And in the end, even Bowser Jr., one of the most single-handedly dangerous threats to the Mario Sunshine ecosystem, was just looking for a mother and attacking Mario who had already been raised to hate. There really are no true villains in Mario Sunshine. Ultimately, there's just winners and losers. Howdy! Since the video is wrapping up, I just wanted to give a super special thanks to 2C Phoenix for that amazing cameo in the blooper section, and to Nick Luigi as well for being the wonderful voice of the Piantas. Also, a very warm thank you to Painted by Lavender on Instagram for making this wonderfully bodacious PNG tuber. And last but not least, thank you, Oodles and Oodles, for watching this video. If you liked it more than anything, I'd just love to hear what you have to say in the comments. And one last time, thank you for stopping by.